I think number 10 has been pretty tight lipped. And all that I'm gleaning is probably what everyone else is gleaning, which is newspaper reports. It looks as if they're going to propose a deal to the UK that we should have red and green channels for the admittance of goods into Northern Ireland uh, and that there should be a more low key role for the European Court of Justice. But beyond that, I really haven't heard. And I think that we do need that detail so that we can make an assessment of whether or not whatever deal is proposed is acceptable, not only to the people of Northern Ireland, but the people of the UK as a whole. I mean, David, you've been involved uh, with this protocol since its inception almost. Um, did you understand that it was to be a temporary provision uh, when you uh, seen it in the withdrawal agreement? Is that your understanding of the protocol? Yes. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is that the protocol says on the face of it, effectively, that it's to be a temporary arrangement. Uh, if you look at Article 13.8, it actually uh, contemplates what will happen to replace the protocol in due course. And it was only because the protocol was presented as a temporary state of affairs mm -hmm. that I think that Parliament approved it when it, it voted on it uh, back uh, in 2019. So uh, really, uh, the fact that the EU is sticking to the protocol and in fact has been very insistent upon adhering to the letter of the protocol yeah. uh, is extremely disappointing. And quite clearly, we've got to replace it. And, and part of their sticking to the protocol is that they continue to say that they are protecting uh, the Belfast Agreement, uh, David. And you and I both know that that's simply not the case. And in actual fact, they're damaging the Belfast Agreement. Well, I think there's no doubt about that. The Belfast Agreement uh, actually says that there should be no constitutional changes in Northern Ireland without the consent of the majority of its people. And it's very important to note, too, that the very first article of the protocol, Article 1, mm -hmm. says in terms that the protocol itself is without prejudice to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. So it's acknowledging that, if you like, the, the it's acknowledging the primacy of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and recognising that the protocol itself is subordinate to that agreement. David, I wanted to ask you about the negotiation strategy of the Prime Minister and the fact that the protocol bill has been paused. Uh, as you know, it was meant to come to the House of Lords and it hasn't. Uh, do you think that that is a good strategy, uh, given uh, that uh, we are trying to get the uh, European Union to face up to the fact that that's not working, the protocol is not working, uh, and that it should be replaced? No, I actually think it's the wrong strategy. Uh, history shows that the European Union will yeah. only respond when it's uh, when pressure is applied to it. And in fact, uh, some time ago, Boris Johnson proved that when he threatened to withdraw David Frost from the talks. Uh, when there was a particularly difficult moment in the negotiations with the EU. And as soon as he did that, the EU immediately softened its position yeah. uh, and started talking more sensibly. And I think that we have got the ideal vehicle in the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, which enables the UK unilaterally to disapply these rules as they apply to Northern Ireland uh, if they can't come to terms with the UK on it. The, 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 the bill empowers the government to take those steps and it, it, it's another weapon in the arsenal of the arsenal of the government. And I think it is really quite the wrong policy to leave it becalmed as it is in, in the shallows of the House of Lords. I think that the government should be pressing on with that as quickly as possible, insisting that the House of Lords passes it. If the House of Lords won't pass it, then invoking the Parliament Act so that the House of Commons can unilaterally again uh, ensure that that legislation goes through. I think that that is the right way to do it because it shows determination on the part of the British government, which is what we do need to do in these negotiations. Indeed, and you will remember well that both Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss during the leadership hustings both said that they were committed to the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, but that seems to have shifted since the Prime Minister, the, the current Prime Minister, came into office. Uh, I'm afraid it has. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, we received assurances from a number of candidates prior to that election that they would press ahead with the bill. Um, I, I think that the Prime Minister, after his meetings in Belfast today, should reflect uh, upon sentiment in Northern Ireland and particularly in the, in the unionist community mm -hmm. uh, and decide whether the, 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 the strategy which he seems to have adopted of a softly, softly approach to the European Union is the correct one. Uh, and maybe, I hope, after taking further advice 
uh, decide that he has to press on with the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. Uh, There are certain things that we need to do because the, the measures that we're seeing at the moment, it seems to me, are primarily cosmetic. Uh, we're seeing new arrangements for uh, the passage of goods into uh, 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 into Northern Ireland, which doesn't actually obviate the need for checks anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're seeing still the uh, supremacy of the European Court of Justice, uh, although it said that will be through a filter of the Northern Ireland courts, which, it, as a matter of fact, was always the case anyway. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, um, what, what we do need to see, I think, Arlene, uh, mm-hmm. is to move to a state of affairs where European law no longer applies in Northern Ireland at all. Uh, And if we arrive at that state of affairs, then we needn't worry about the European Court of Justice because it won't have any role anyway. Yes, and and that's the critical point, is it not, uh, to recognise the internal market of the United Kingdom uh, as opposed to pushing Northern Ireland into the the single market of the European Union and outside of the single market of the United Kingdom. And that's the crux of everything that we're talking about. I, I think that's right. And of course, there are ways in which you can uh, protect both the EU single market mm. and the UK's own internal market. And that is by adopting a, a process of mutual enforcement, uh, whereby uh, each side undertakes to be responsible for ensuring that any goods leaving its territory and moving into the territory of the other party complies with the other party's regulations. Yeah. Uh, th- that's something that was proposed quite a few years ago now. And in fact, it was floated to Michel Barnier, who I understand was quite attracted by that proposal. Uh, And it's a very unusual state of affairs where a a government of one uh, country or or one uh, block actually has uh, legislative authority in the territory of another country. And it's a very strange state of affairs where the the, the foreign court has jurisdiction in another state. It is is anomalous and, and doesn't normally happen. And I think we have to get away from that approach when deciding what the permanent arrangement is going to be between the UK uh, and the European Union over Northern Ireland. Well, we'll wait to see where it goes after today, David. But in the meantime, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks, Arlene. Pleasure.